Uh, well, let me first congratulate and thank uh, the student government for uh, sponsoring this event uh, tonight. I don't know, we've had this uh, at least uh, since Benjamin president. Is this our second or third? It's our second. Second uh, annual. So, uh, I'm delighted uh, that this one is taking place in our new student center. The last one, as I recall, we were in the, uh, the Rocky Top Student Center on the, on the York Hill campus. This uh, facility, I, I hope you're uh, coming to enjoy it. Uh, this was the longest uh, renovation in the history of Quinnipiac University, and we've had a lot of renovations, so it was a long time coming. So again, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, well, I, we want to keep uh, remarks brief. We really want to hear from you uh, and have all of us uh, address some of your concerns and answer whatever questions you have on your mind. But let me just say, this is uh, another uh, very successful year for Quinnipiac University. Uh, certainly the high point of the year was the accreditation of our new medical school. Um, and while um, Many of you might not be thinking of medical school immediately in your future, in your immediate future. Um, it is a very significant development in terms of Quinnipiac standing and the ultimate in higher education and the ultimate value of your degree. Uh, there are uh, almost 4,000 colleges and universities in this country. Uh, there are only 200 ABA approved law schools. Uh, there are only 139, we're the 139th uh, LCME uh, accredited medical schools. And fewer than 100 universities out of the 4,000 country have both a medical school and a law school. And when you add the engineering school that we're developing, the numbers get uh, even smaller. Uh, and they're not only uh, a small group of universities, but they're among the very best universities in America. So um, hopefully when you graduate and the, the value of your degree, I can remember 25 years ago when I came here, I, I said that Quinnipiac was one of the best kept secrets in, in higher education. My goal was to make it the worst kept secret. Uh, and while we're not declaring victory as of yet, uh, I must say that the good name and academic reputation of Quinnipiac has been extended uh, uh, far and wide. The medical school will also do some very interesting things with our School of Nursing and our School of Health Sciences. They'll be doing some uh, interdisciplinary, what's called interprofessional education, educating uh, health students together with the hope that if they're educated together uh, and learn together, uh, that they'll practice uh, as teams as they as they must do effectively when they when they leave this institution. So bringing all three of them together uh, in uh, a building that's under construction right now uh, that we're calling the Center for Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences uh, on our North Haven campus will be a tremendous addition and will not only benefit uh, the medical school that we have here, but also the School of Nursing and the School of Health Sciences uh, more generally. We're very pleased that we just have been accepted into a new athletic conference, and proving the, the, the conferences that we're in, um, not so much uh, athletically, although that's important as well, but really academically. Uh, uh, we're thrilled, obviously, that our hockey program has been in the ECAC, which is arguably, um, when you combine the academics of the Harvards and Yale, the Princeton Browns, and Cornells, and, and Quinnipiacs of the world, uh, and the quality of, of athletics in the ice hockey area. Uh, I think the ECAC conference is probably the finest uh, combined athletic academic conference anywhere uh, in America. And in case you don't know, we have a little game down the street here uh, this coming Saturday uh, with the, uh, I guess we have a, an important game on Friday as well against Brown. And of course, uh, the men's hockey team as well as the ice hockey team for, for women's uh, is having another great year as well. But the men's rank second in the nation um, and within six or seven votes of being number one in the nation is uh, pretty phenomenal when you think about uh, um, that it wasn't that many years ago uh, when I came here, believe it or not, the hockey program was playing in the Hamden High School arena uh, that I had the misfortune of attending at least one game in. It wasn't the best facility in the world. They used to practice at about two or three o'clock in the morning. And then we went to the Northford facility um, and now you know, we have a, uh, an outstanding facility at TD Bank Sports Center. But I'm thrilled that uh, the rest of our sports will be moving into uh, the MAC conference, uh, uh, which is uh, certainly a stronger, uh, I think, both academic and athletic conference uh, for us, particularly for men's and women's basketball, but for really all the sports. It also will get us into, uh, into the New York City area in a much bigger way. We will actually be uh, the four of the best um, uh, New York City and, and New York City vicinity uh, schools. Uh, Manhattan, I own a great rivals you right in the city, um, and uh, Fairfield and Quinnipiac University, now uh, the next two closest ones to the city, and, and 
Fairfield will be a great uh, rivalry for us in this, in this state. It's a great academic and athletic uh, institution. So that was another major goal for us, and uh, uh, I'm thrilled and uh, excited about uh, getting into that conference. And again, it's another statement uh, about how the, the higher education and the broader uh, community views uh, uh, Quinnipiac University. We also dedicated a new uh, um, uh, museum on Broader Moor, Ireland's Great Hungry Museum. We have here at Quinnipiac the largest collection of uh, Irish uh, Great Hungry related art literally anywhere in the world. And uh, when you think of the international recognition that we're receiving for that, not only in, in the broader New York and uh, uh, Irish American community, but uh, uh, the international community. This museum is well known in Ireland. Um, we had the Minister for Tourism from Ireland, Little Red Car was here. Uh, uh, you probably remember the dropkick Murphy's more than the dedication of the museum. Uh, but uh, the Consul General of Ireland was here. And, and again, it's another another uh, statement about Quinnipiac and, uh, and, and most of the great universities, including Yale University down the street from us, they have a museum, a British museum, a museum of British art. Um, and uh, uh, the great universities have museums as well, both for educational purposes as well as for contributions to the community. So that was another big event this year. The, but let me just close up one final thing that uh, I don't think uh, we've talked about very much, but it's actually going to be very significant for all of you and for this campus. Uh, and it will be something that happens 18 months from now, which is not that long. Uh, we will be finishing up the renovation for the Center for Medicine, Nursing, and Health Sciences on the North Haven campus this summer, uh, with our first medical students arriving uh, this August. Uh, and uh, at that same time this summer we will begin renovations for the third uh, facility that's there um, uh, so that we move our law school uh, in, the, uh, in the summer of uh, 2014. So think about it, 18 months from now, I know space is, a, is, a, is always on the minds of, uh, uh, of Quinnipiac students and the Quinnipiac community, but that law school building uh, that we just dedicated in 1995, will be empty uh, by the law school in the summer of 2014. And all of that, that space will be utilized on this campus for our undergraduate students. When you think about the, the need for additional classrooms, faculty offices, you think of the parking that surrounds uh, that building. Um, again, all needs that we have on this campus. The law school building, it would be this, the equivalent of, of building three Eklund Center or three uh, Lender uh, Center buildings additional on this campus. And, and while we will have some growth at the undergraduate level uh, with our uh, 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 engineering school coming on board, uh, the amount of space we'll be adding, as I said, will be uh, three buildings the size of, of Eklund or the Lender Center. So it will be a tremendous amount of space for additional classrooms, uh, for faculty offices, there's some beautiful facilities there. It's one of our newest buildings and we put a lot of resources into that. It's as an event like this, maybe next uh, in a year and a half from now, we'll have it in the Grand Courtroom, which will provide a wonderful venue for outside groups and, and major conferences and, and speakers on the campus. That facility uh, seats about, what, 225 or so, or larger than Buckman, Buckman and, uh, and will be the, the really the largest venue on, on this campus. So, um, and the other thing that we'll do, it will really, as we move the law school to the North Haven campus, that will complete the the, the, really the movement of most of our graduate programs, which will allow this campus to really be uh, an undergraduate campus, and uh, uh, this obviously combined with the York Hill campus. But in terms of academic facilities, all the buildings on this quadrangle, they also have a huge library, which we will not need, we can renovate it for, for quiet study space and, and other kinds of labs on the campus. Uh, uh, they have uh, uh, some facilities there for dining and uh, uh, student clubs and organizations. So that would be a huge addition. Uh, again, it's only 18 months uh, from now that that facility will be available. So, and hopefully that will help at least uh, address some of the space needs uh, that are important and uh, that we need to address in, in the next uh, several years. So with that, I'll end it and uh, throw it back to you, whoever, Ben, or whatever, and uh, I look forward to taking your questions as to all the administrators up here. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who's here right now, um, all the students, everyone watching from home, and especially uh, these administrators uh, who made this all possible. 
Um, so the past two semesters, um, we've looked into improving a couple of different major areas of student life, um, including school spirit, uh, university dining, as well as uh, student health and safety. So to those ends, we have collaborated with Charwells to bring extended dining options to all three campuses. Um, we have looked to extend hours in all of these facilities, and as well address concerns of students with special food needs. <coughs> Um, also, with the help of David Barker, we have instituted, created and instituted a shuttle schedule um, from Mount Carmel to York Hill uh, to better the commute from uh, York Hill down to Mount Carmel for academic classes and things of that nature. Um, as well, we have instituted a parking policy uh, regulation. This was uh, in the spring of, of 2012 um, that we all see now in the fall uh, that juniors uh, cannot park, or, I'm sorry, juniors living on York Hill cannot park um, on Mount Carmel campus. Uh, until 3.30, um, we worked with, uh, <coughs> with David Barger, uh, Manny Carrero, and uh, President Mayhew with that as well. Um, and finally, uh, with Manny's help, we have adjusted the York Hill uh, Health Center hours um, to better fit uh, the times that students are up there. So last year, um, there was a lot of concern about um, the availability of these resources up at the York Hill Health Center um, for students, um, mostly because the, the facility was open um, from 11 to 6 or 11 to 7. Um, We've actually changed that so that it's open from 3 to 11 p.m. Um, because that's uh, the most highly trafficked time um, of those students who happen to live up there. Uh, additionally, the Senior Class Cabinet um, has created a Senior Quick Links uh, webpage, uh, bringing many areas of the student uh, senior experience together under one online hub. Um, and as well, they've created a housing FAQ sheet for uh, juniors, incoming juniors, uh, in collaboration with Residential Life to help answer any questions. Uh, comments or concerns that uh, incoming seniors might have about the housing process. Uh, we also we also looked at our own organization. Um, we've seen areas of opportunity to provide better transparency and communication to the student body as a whole. Um, so to this end, um, we have created a website, um, qusga.com. Um, that's Brian Scanlon's doing and the, the Public Relations Committee, so I commend him for that. Um, we've also, uh, Eric Cody, along with the Finance Committee, has uh, put all of the financial uh, Financial um, systems online for student organizations. So it's uh, this, the process is streamlined, um, no more paper. Uh, it's much more efficient that way. Um, additionally, uh, Evan Milos and the Student Awareness Committee have created the Friday FYI. Um, hopefully, uh, you all have heard of it, and if not, I'll tell you what it is. Um, every other Friday, the student government puts out um, kind of an update on what we've been working on over the last two weeks, and we broadcast it to the student body through our website, social media, our Twitter. Uh, Etc. And that's been wildly successful as well in, in helping us get out to the students what we've been working on. Um, and we've also increased our GPA requirement uh, for student student government members uh, by 0.25 for general members and 0.25 for executive board members as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And finally, with the help of uh, Dr. Thompson and other administrators, last spring we were able to secure um, recognition of commencement honor cords uh, during the commencement ceremonies. Um, so, Dr. Thompson, thank you for that. In the future, we're looking forward to tackling issues regarding programming space, um, as Dr. Leahy mentioned, um, school spirit, and as well student housing. Um, no campus is perfect, but I'm proud of the Student Government Association of the last two, two semesters um, and the work that they've done and uh, their commitment to bettering the student body. Um, we're here to improve the campus community, improve the campus climate, uh, make the lives of our peers better, and I, uh, I commend the work of, of all members um, and as well the, the, the collaboration with administrators to, uh, to achieve those ends. Um, so thank you to everyone uh, who has been putting in that work. We, we see it and we appreciate it, um, so thank you. Um, and finally, I encourage you all to uh, use those little question sheets at your, at your seat. Um, pass them over to the back table over there. You guys can wave for us. Yeah, all right, great. Um, so pass it in over there. Um, and we'll be able to incorporate your questions hopefully later on um, in the program. So thank you. Have a good night. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. It's great to see so many students come out tonight. I do appreciate it. And I want to tell you, too, if your questions don't get asked and answered tonight, don't be bashful about sending them to Evan. I would ask Evan to pass them along and be happy to address your individual questions if you don't get a chance to get to them tonight. With regard to medical school, I'm happy to tell you that the progress we've made, that everything is on schedule with regard to the hiring process, all the staff and faculty that we need to open. The accreditation process, as you know, um, 
was successful. Uh, the construction schedule is on. Uh, it's going well. There's no problems there. So we expect a successful opening uh, for the incoming class uh, for the fall, this coming fall. Uh, the emphasis on primary care was actually very strategic on our part. Uh, if you take a look at the need across the country, where the greatest need is in terms of uh, future doctors to be trained, it's about a the projected gap is about 20,000 in terms of a shortage of primary care doctors uh, over the course of the next five or six years. So there's a, a growing need for primary care in our communities across the country. Uh, in addition to that, if you're paying attention to federal health care policy, uh, there is a drive towards uh, that is resulting in a need for more primary care doctors as well. So the combination of the demand being driven even more by federal health policy is very important. Uh, so we were very strategic in that, recognizing there was a need to be filled. Happy to tell you that for the 60 spots that we have in our uh, incoming inaugural class for the fall of 2013, we had more than 2,000, about 2,000 applicants uh, for those spots, just to give you a sense as to the demands among prospective students in terms of what they'd like to pursue uh, for their future careers. So for now, we're going to stick with that. We haven't even got started yet. We'll see how it goes. And like everything we do, uh, certainly we'll reassess along the way to see if there is a, a change in strategy that would benefit us as an institution. But as I said, it's a very strategic decision. I think it's one we need to see how it will play out for now, and I think we made the right choice. It also fits very well with our other programs in terms of, again, promoting interprofessional education across nursing and health sciences, recognizing that there will be an emphasis on a team approach to delivery in health care. We think it fits out very nicely with that as well. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, what happens with that particular, uh, with uh, Hurricane Sandy was that there were decisions made by uh, emergency operations here that based on our ability to get power to the classrooms, we were working on a day-by-day -day basis. I would also defer back to uh, Dr. Thompson uh, on this particular question, uh, but it was uh, made by the uh, Emergency Operations uh, Committee as to what was going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Perhaps where we did lack a little bit was communication to the students and to their families on uh, how the decisions were made and making them in a timely fashion. And again, hoping that we never get hit again by something like Sandy, uh, we will have to make those adjustments. I truly hope this was a one in 100 year event, but I don't, I don't know, I can't guarantee that. So we may be faced with a similar situation going forward, we never know. But I, we do learn things from these events. Uh, I would say uh, two things uh, with regard to communication. Certainly looking back, there are things we could have done differently, there's no question about it. One of the things we did talk about was uh, going forward, if we have a similar event, to commit to uh, particular times on each day that at least some communication goes out, even if it's to say there is no new information. So perhaps at 10 o'clock in the morning, at 6 o'clock at night, you could be guaranteed that some communication will go out to your parents and your families to have some sense as to whether or not there's new information to be shared, or if there's nothing, nothing new, I think that's important as well. There was some confusion with regard to uh, the extent of the damage to the electrical grid uh, coming onto the campus. There was some as you can imagine, the extent of the storm, not just here at Winnipeg, but the surrounding area, and the attempts to coordinate the efforts of both uh, various towns as well as the electrical utilities. Sometimes that doesn't go as planned, given all the things in terms of trying to prioritize where they're going to send their resources and so forth, and the coordination across different uh, groups that have to come together in order to restore utilities and so forth. So it was midweek, we had some expectation that electricity was going to be restored more quickly. It turned out as a result of some lack of coordination between various parties, I don't want to point fingers, but uh, that uh, as a result, we weren't able to open as soon as we thought we were going to be able to. So as things changed, we did do our very best to make sure that you had the information. Uh, we did have some expectations that weren't met, uh, but again, uh, we'll certainly do our best to always do better in these situations going forward and learn from the things that uh, occurred uh, during the event. Thank you. Uh, I might just say that uh, one of the things that I learned uh, as a result of, of um, Hurricane Sandy is that uh, we did not, we do not have as, as robust a 
uh, a backup a generated system on the campus as, as I thought. Um, we have uh, sufficient backup generation to allow you to stay in your residence halls. We have sufficient amount to let you go to your dining facilities and basically take care of your health and basic needs. Um, I was not aware that we did not have enough um, backup generation power to run our classrooms and to have the technology and other things that are available. So that's an area that we're looking at now and, the, and I've charged our, our senior management team to come back with recommendations. So um, uh, it seems to me it's, uh, it's not much benefit of keeping all the students on campus here in residence halls and dining facilities if we can't educate let you go into the classrooms. Uh, um, in most cases, we would have be been better off let you go home. And uh, of course, in this case, in the storm, we probably, in many cases, would have been sending you into a worse situation in New York, New Jersey, uh, where many of you are from. So, so we are looking into that, uh, um, the backup generation, as I said. We have good backup generation for the basic needs of students living on uh, campus here. But we do not have sufficient, we do not have sufficient generation to allow us to fully function in terms of classrooms uh, uh, and other uh, activities to, to uh, for it to make sense to have us uh, fully open. So that's an area where we'll certainly be uh, we're looking for the recommendations, and we'll be investing additional resources in using. as the Chief Academic Officer is to talk with my colleagues and other institutions across the country. I think uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, we're in a very fortunate position as an institution. Uh, most institutions today are suffering from either uh, stagnation in terms of their ability to get more resources to better serve students or resources being reduced. Uh, I hear of uh, faculty who are retiring and not being replaced places where faculty haven't had raises for several years, staff haven't had raises, which is impacting morale. All of that, you know, trying to do more with less, uh, lower morale among faculty and staff, all filter down into a, a detrimental impact on the students. And I'm happy to say that that's not the case uh, here at uh, One of the things we paid a lot of attention to uh, is, as you know, I hope that you see evidence of it very clearly, is anything that we do has making sure that it has a positive impact on students and enhances the quality and our capability to do things that uh, benefit you. I have some numbers to share with you uh, in anticipation of this question. Uh, from the fall of 2009 to this last fall of 2012, our student population did grow uh, by 11.3%, uh, 7,700 plus to a grade of 8,600. But our commitment to hiring faculty uh, out far outpaced the growth of the student population. Uh, Full-time faculty increased by 31 percent over the same period of time. That's virtually unheard of uh, in terms of level of investment made by an institute of higher education in this environment with this economy. So I'm very happy that we were able to add 90 new full-time faculty, we went from 294 to 384. That's exclusive of the School of Medicine. There was another 20 or so faculty hired in the School of Medicine, but of course they're not going to be students quite yet because we don't have any. Of that, so. That's, uh, you know, we've far outpaced uh, the growth in the student population. I can tell you that for next year's budget, for new uh, faculty positions for the fall of uh, 2013, there's another 21 new full-time faculty positions added to the budget. So since 2009, that will uh, result in an increase of 38% of the full-time uh, faculty. What that's allowed us to do is uh, it's had advan advantages in terms of the quality of advising to students. Uh, we've dramatically increased the coverage of student credit hours by full-time faculty. And I think, uh, you know, in addition to our full-time faculty, of course, we're very careful in the selection of part-time faculty to ensure the quality is there in the, in the classroom and so forth. Uh, again, you'd be hard-pressed to find that kind of investment taking place. It wasn't limited to faculty, by the way. We also invested very heavily in additions to staff and in ways that directly impact uh, the student services area in uh, residential life, in the student center, in counseling, in the library. So we're very careful to make sure that we did invest, but not only just invest uh, in ways that, uh, we were very careful to make sure that we did it in ways that uh, directly impact you with quality of your education and the instability of your experience here and multiple year degree. So quite proud of the way that you've uh, 
responding to that growth. seniors back on campus and, 
Uh, and so any feedback from Ben and through the student government uh, that the broader student body can give to us as to where and what type of residence halls would be the most attractive to get more uh, seniors or to keep seniors uh, from going off campus in the future would be very helpful to us. I think, Evan, that, that's been pretty well uh, addressed by Dr. Ferguson and by President Leahy. So, uh, what we'll be looking at is reallocating certain parking lots uh, for commuters, for juniors, for seniors, and for sophomores as time moves on. Again, those numbers are, are fluid, and as we have our freshman class progress to be a sophomore class, we will have to look at those numbers and utilizing all those parking areas. I don't know how greatly we'll improve the situation for next year. Hopefully we can do something with the park we have. But again, keep in mind what I, what I mentioned in my uh, uh, opening remarks. Uh, we have 400 law students on this campus every day. We have 35 law faculty uh, and another 20 or so staff. So they will be off this campus. Uh, so right now they're parking this campus. My guess is they're probably parking in pretty high premium parking spaces and locations. <laughs> So as they move to the North Haven campus in a year and a half from now, all of that will be freed up and my guess is it will certainly be helpful uh, in alleviating some of the, not only the parking uh, in terms of the total spaces, but where ideal parking and more convenient parking is from. Uh, right now we continually work with DACO Transportation in trying to improve what we have in the level of service. Right now we are looking at several different initiatives that we are uh, trying to sell, if you will, DACO on. But of course they are our vendor and uh, they draw quite a bit of uh, ridership from us. Uh, we have a number of buses, as you all know, traveling across campus at any given time. So what we're looking at initially is what's called the Translock system. Translock system will enable you on your Joy or iPhone to track your particular bus. The Yale is using it, uh, Boston University is using it, Boston College is also using it. And what that does is if you know the number of your bus, you know whether it's on what would be known as a green line, a red line, a blue line, whatever, you would be able to track that bus and see where it is minute by minute on your Joy or on your iPhone. Again, uh, that's technology, and we're working on it along with DACO. We are also looking to have a DACO representative on campus during those times when we have the highest ridership on the buses, and that they can answer whatever we need at that particular time. They are there. Last but not least, since here in the state of Connecticut, you can no longer use cell phones, and those of you who rode the buses know that the drivers communicate with us via cell phone. We are now looking at, uh, initially now, a totally new radio system for everyone here across campus, which would incorporate the buses so that we would have constant two-way communication with them. Again, uh, we continually looking with SGA at our bus schedules and at our bus stops. Those of you who live in the state of Connecticut know we have two seasons, winter and under construction. During under construction, of course, the schedule always suffers. Those of you who are uh, juniors and seniors can testify to that while they were working on Whitney Avenue and Mount Carmel Avenue. It certainly threw our bus schedules into a state of flux. But as we move forward, we're trying to introduce this technology and some of the real simple technology, such as a two-way radio, in order to stay in touch with the bus drivers. <laughs> I guess this is my question again also. <laughs> Two in a row. What we're looking at on campus, again, one of our little used uh, services that we offer are escorts again across campus. I want everyone here to remember, I want this campus to be as safe as it can be, and I want you to feel as though this is your home. If you are safe, then you can learn. It gives you a safe, secure environment. We light Bobcat way up like 
Fenway Park on game night. So many students don't feel the need to have an escort from the library at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, or they're traveling with friends, which is always a great suggestion to you. But what we need you to remember, we do have an escort service, and all you need to do is pick up the phone and call extension 6200, or if you're in the library, contact one of the officers who are in the library and tell them that you need an escort back to wherever you're going. Again, escort service, I believe I was talking with Evan uh, at the end of last semester and this came up and he said, do you keep statistics on how many times it's used? And I said, yes, twice last semester. In the total of last year, only six times the service was utilized. Another thing that we're looking at is expanding our bike patrol. We are very, very happy and very, very proud to have the bike patrol and have it at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, our fall semester. We are looking to expand that bike patrol to another three bicycles. We look at that as being the vehicle by which our officers can get into the residential areas much quicker than they can with a vehicle, much quicker than they could with a club car, much quicker than they could with a Segway, and are able to interact with the students. Again, we want our officers out there patrolling the areas, around the dorms, in and out of the dorms, the residential halls, and we want them to be interacting with the students. So you hope to see probably sometime in April an addition of three more bicycles and they will go across the shifts. And we will be adding one more bicycle, or actually one bicycle, to uh, York Hill. But I can't find an officer yet who will ride down until I pedal back up. <laughs>
as a whole, but for the whole student, which is essential, I think, in everything that we do for you, whether it's in the classroom or outside the classroom. But if I sound too confident about this wonderful relationship that we have, and there are other things that I'm missing, you know where to find me. And if you don't know where to find me, just ask for the name of the whole time, and they'll lead you there. texting system. That is one of the first things that we instituted. Right now we have about 90% of the students online with that. If there's 10% of you out there tonight, get to the link and get signed up. But that allows us to send out a mass text to anyone on campus, any student who has a cell phone or handheld mobile device, and that message will go to you. I can tell you, walking up and down Bobcat Way, every student has at least one handheld mobile device. Some of them several, because we notice that type of thing. So, that's number one. Number two, we need to be partners with local law enforcement, both municipal, state, and federal law enforcement, that we actually like to interact with almost on a weekly basis. We look at crime trends every Tuesday morning. One of my assistant chiefs attends a meeting with the New Haven Police Department and the Yale Police Department, and what they do is they look at the trends down in New Haven. I'm sure more than one student here has been down to New Haven for some type of cultural exchange <laughs> over the past several years, and it's good to know the trends. To answer that, I don't know if you've noticed if any of you students do in fact take the buses to New Haven on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night, we now have a seven-man dedicated team just utilized for the buses. Now, I can tell you right now that was partly in our discussions with SGA, in particular with Evan, um, how we were going to do that. So we have one dedicated squad, if you will, to do that. They know the students, they know the area, they know New Haven. So back uh, last semester when we had those uh, problems with uh, gangs on bicycles riding across the green, so on and so forth, we were very well aware of it. We were able to work with the New Haven Police Department, the Yale Police Department. In fact, I don't know if you follow the newspaper, but it had to do with several of our officers down there recognizing one of the individuals that they were arrested. So again, we try to keep those trends, we try to be proactive. We work with the Hampton Police Department on a daily basis. Many of you have seen their cars come in here several times a day. We try to familiarize their entire department with the layout of the university. We have on their mobile, mobile data terminals, they all have floor plans of every building in existence here at Quinnipiac. That helps them respond to the area. Many of you have probably heard the term since Newtown thrown around active shooter. During your break, the Hamden tactical team was here on campus touring all of our buildings, touring all of our residential halls, both on this campus and on the York Hill campus. Once again, to make themselves totally familiar with the campus. We continue to train our officers. We just had our second academy class, one with Fairfield to train public safety officers, and one that we held here that we graduated 30 officers from. So again, training is paramount to everything that we do. We are trying to make a force of public safety officers that are well trained, know how to go out in the community, and know how to recognize those things that could cause problems on this campus. I think the person who's responsible for that area is not our panel uh, tonight. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, you know, going forward, we're all first uh, dining hall and dining hall experiences are important. Part of student life, and we all recognize that, uh, and uh, we also recognize the importance of, uh, importance of uh, being efficient and cost-effective in what is done. And I think, in terms of uh, third-party options, uh, you know, we we have worked 
chart wells, we have a contract with chart wells, but to the extent you know, we can work with others to for doing so. Okay. Uh, one of our issues on the uh, Sherman Avenue, uh, we have a couple issues there. One is parking. It's basically transportation there. It's either parking or busing, and, and the those buildings actually supporting environments were designed for the uh, BA program that at one point uh, graduate person was there. So the numbers of people involved there were uh, quite modest. And so a, a primary issue for us is just the logistics of being able to use those uh, buildings. I mean, if in fact they were closer, say, to the York Hill uh, shuttle bus run, that would work out fine. Right now there's not a sidewalk, for instance, that goes uh, from the uh, bottom of York Hill uh, Drive up there, and I don't know if they want to speak to. I mean, safety is our primary concern about right? access. Again, one of the reasons we don't run a bus to either of those buildings on Sherman is, uh, again, as Dr. Ferguson pointed out, if we were able to discharge uh, passengers at the bottom of York Hill, there is no sidewalk, there is no safe way for any student to walk there. The second problem that we have is the line of sight for a large bus to turn around in that particular area. If, uh, if you have ever been over at those buildings in those parking lots and pulled your vehicle out onto Sherman Avenue, you can see that there is a short line of sight as it goes down toward the York Hill driveway. So again, bearing in mind safety, we cannot have a bus pull into the parking lot discharge students or pick up students and then safely pull out onto the roadway. Until we have something that would be similar to a, a state or town recognized bus stop in the area, we would be unable to use that property uh, for the bus, for bus traffic. Yes, um, no, we have discussed uh, club sports. Uh, I've decided that when the time comes, that we, uh, at this point, feel that we are prepared to implement the program. But that will probably, it's probably a couple of years of that. We're looking to acquire all of Hamden. <laughs>
and very little money for development and very little lending to do those kinds of things. I think we're just coming out of that, but we're having active discussions with uh, private developers to build a more collegiate inn there, a nicer uh, uh, place for uh, people to stay overnight. Um, uh, we hope to attract uh, Starbucks and, and other more upscale types of restaurants and, and places. Um, and the, the buying power, as you can imagine, of students. Uh, um, and we know through the cue card and the demand that's out there uh, to have more retail places be allowed to uh, use the cue card. Uh, there's a, a good story to be told to bring in more private developers. So I do see that developing over time. It will take, obviously, a little more time, but uh, uh, we think we already have a significant enough amount of real estate right there, um, and with the cooperation uh, the town, as well as the state, um, both of whom are well aware of what we own and what our plans are to improve that area. They're very much supportive of it. Uh, we just need the economy to continue to pick up a little more so that private developers will put some things there. We can add something, we can take some equity stakes in some of the development, but we don't want to, we'd rather use our resources primarily to, to, to hire the faculty that uh, Mark has talked about, the facilities of campus, and uh, uh, we don't want to get into the business of running retail operations, we'd rather have the private developers do those kinds of things. So, uh, But I think over time you will see that, that whole strip of campus um, be dotted with more and more Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac related things, and or inns and, and Starbucks and bistros and, and, and places that will give a much more uh, collegiate feel to that whole strip between our two campuses. We are certainly looking at uh, various areas in the world in terms of attempting to attract students on a strategic basis. So we're taking a look at countries that we, uh, are, for example, we know uh, Turkey is a, a mar potential market for us given their interest in certain types of programs that we have here and we do a high quality job of uh, providing the students. So uh, a lot of interest, for example, in finance and business related programs, we know that's a good fit for what we have in place. And I do think, you know, that you, you don't just go out and cast a wide net it's like everything we do, we're very strategic at it. We think very carefully about the market implications. We think about the impact on our current student body. And uh, think about what's best for us as a, as a community. And certainly, bringing in uh, more international students is a benefit to us in terms of adding to the diversity that we have in our community and the advantage that we can take from that. But I do think uh, you know, some of the growth you'll see in the graduate programs will certainly come from uh, some targeted uh, recruitment of students from uh, different split them. Uh, there are certainly among the master planning process, one of the things we do recognize is that one of the major needs we have with regard to facilities uh, and directly relates to services to students is to not only improve the athletics facilities on this campus, but also the facilities around uh, offering more recreational opportunities as well as intramural uh, opportunities. So that is certainly uh, something that we're working on as part of the whole master planning process. But, I can tell you that I can deny that rumor. There's no plan uh, to separate athletics and recreation. Thank you. And, and this last question uh, seems more of like an invitation, but President Leahy, would you be willing to come to a student event like breakfast um, for president for students to talk with you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And thanks again for your responses. Thank you. Thanks for everyone who submitted a question. Really appreciate it. Um, now, Eric, what do you think? So once again, um, we'd like to thank the people on SGA who put this together, um, the Student Awareness Committee as well as the Programming Committee. Um, and certainly we'd like to thank our panel. Um, when they say that they have open doors, uh, they really do mean it. Um, obviously in student government, we work with them more closely. Um, so we would, we would kind of love to get some more feedback from students. Um, I'm just going to very quickly mention some, some ways that you can communicate with SGA. Um, ben mentioned our website, QUSGA.com. You can tweet at us, at QUSGA. You can be our friend on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Quinnipiac SGA. You can email us at sga at Or you can come see us in person 
in our offices, which are located right up here in the room. Um, so once again, everyone, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we appreciate uh, kind of all your questions and um, your engagement throughout the night. So thank you.